Welcome to Big Blend Radio's Military Monday Show with Mike Guardia, award-winning author and historian. Hey, everybody. Today, uh, we're going to be talking about Black military history. We're celebrating Black History Month. And, of course, Mike Guardia is here. We're going to be talking about Buffalo Soldiers, Tuskegee Airmen. We're going to talk about some Black military leaders like Colin Powell, uh, Julius Becton Jr. Uh, you never know where we go with these conversations with Mike, but he always has some great information and just teaches. I don't know. You, you're the greatest teacher, Mike. How are you? <laughs> Uh, I'm doing great, Lisa. Thank you. And uh, yeah, it is always a pleasure to be on the show. So, you know, because you do teach too, right? We should tell people, I know we always talk about your books and being an author, maybe being on the History Channel and all that wonderful stuff, but you also do actually teach. I do. Mm. So what do you teach? Can you tell us well, a little bit about that? We want some, uh, we want, yeah, yeah, we want yeah. the gossip. <laughs> okay. So for the better part of a decade, um, I have taught primarily at the college level. Um, I've taught at uh, I've taught at two year colleges, taught at four year colleges, and uh, have also uh, have also taught at college prep schools. Um, so it's uh, it is it it is uh, a passion really that dovetails into everything that I do as a writer. Um, mm. You know, it's, uh, it's really just. Uh, it's really just under the umbrella of getting uh, getting historical education out there, uh, being able to preserve all of the uh, stories so that future generations can have them, and that uh, you know that we all can learn from all of the uh, all of the great periods in American history where you know ordinary people rose to accomplish great things and make our country into exactly what it is today. You know, I was, I was talking about you on an interview a couple weeks ago with an author who's written historical fiction. Mm -hmm. And I was telling him about you and military Monday shows. He's like, well, this is a military Thursday now, you know, like I can't remember what day his, his interview aired. Um, Michael J. Cooper is his name. And he wrote a book called wages of empire. And was about the Ottoman Empire and the Great War of Civilization for civilization for civilization, which is different, right? And um, I was sitting there going, "Where's Mike? I need Mike. <laughs> I remember this in high school, but we didn't get taught all this stuff. Like we didn't get taught. We didn't. I, and I think, and we were talking about it. And this man uh, writes um, historical fiction, you know, so through you know people, you know, the stories." And he's trying to teach and, and he does. He's, he's a great writer, uh, really good writer. And, um, I was talking about you because I, I was saying, well, you know, it's about the people. And I think that's what you do so well is you always teach us about the people and share their stories, uh, in combat or out of, com you know, obviously a lot in combat, right? right? But you're telling us these stories about people so we can relate and understand what, military folks go through i know i always talk about this on shows with you but when you're teaching do you also do that same thing is go into like understand the people is is that part of it as as a teacher i didn't mean to get into a teaching spin but it just kind of happened yeah <laughs> well th th that's really how i uh, uh, approach any topic of history really you know i uh, i i always uh, i've always told myself that uh that history as a discipline is a is a very uh people driven endeavor and you really can't uh teach history i think from any perspective and still have it be meaningful unless you have it as a people driven narrative yeah. i mean granted you're looking at history first and foremost as a timeline so you have to do it sequentially but uh the uh the sequential order of history i think is uh i think is incidental to the stories of the people who were there at that place in time that made those events happen mm -hmm. so uh you know anytime i frame a story that i'm publishing or you know if it's a uh, if it's a class that i'm teaching uh it, it's it's always from the perspective and uh from the experiences of those people who were there and those people who lived it and when you present it in that way and try to make it relatable in a sense to your audience that this could be someone like you or any 
topic in history that we learn about throughout this class, uh, one of your ancestors was alive walking the earth when this event happened. Now, maybe they weren't there to witness it themselves, but they were alive when it happened. And mm. and any one of your ancestors could have lived through any one of these events that we're talking about. And the only reason oh. you might be here today is because one of your ancestors figured out a way to survive whatever historical circumstances were there at the time. Like mm. maybe the only reason you're here today is because one of your far distant ancestors figured out a way to escape from the Black Plague. Or maybe you're here today because one of your distant ancestors whom you have no knowledge of, you know, figured out how to uh, come out alive after the Battle of Shiloh, you know, during the Civil War. So. Wow. So the study of history in a great sense is really the study of us. That's powerful, Mike. Yeah. Dang. Well, now we're going to talk about Black History Month, right? So it's Black History Month. I I'm weird about these months and these holidays, even though we do shows about them. Um, but I've gotten to this place of saying it's a way to shine the light, right? It's kind of a way to remind people of things and people and places. And so I'm, I'm, you know, cause to me, I think black history should be shined upon all the time. Right. Same as native American history, mm-hmm. you know, Irish history, as we've talked about, white mm-hmm. people's history, Every, history should be. But right. apparently, as human beings, kind of need a knock on the head once in a while, right? Like, hello, wakey, wakey, let's remember this. Right. So kind of getting that. Um, when it comes to military has- history in the States, you know, mm-hmm. the United States, it's really interesting to me when we talk about black history. It's like, oh, here we go, majority of the black people that came here came through slavery, right? Majority. Would you say 90%, 99%? Say it's pretty close to that percentage, yeah. Yeah. And so next thing you know, they go through all of these horrors and all of these things. And next thing you know, they're even fighting for the country. Now, it's the same thing I feel like the Navajo Code Talkers, you know, in World War II. It's like, you go through all this, yet you're still helping us, you know? So it's it's an interesting uh, topic to to get into. It's not I don't even like to use the word topic. This is human history. This is people's stories. Right. And um, so when we look at you know African Americans in our in our culture here in our life, um, when d- were the Buffalo Soldiers the first ones to be part of the military? Well, they were the uh, they were the first ones to be part of the military in what I would call a true uniformed sense, because you know, if you uh, if you take a look at the trajectory of African Americans, you know you had uh, you know those who were freedmen, those who were not bound to slavery, they um, they were. Uh, they were assigned to segregated units, and you know if you if you look at the uh, if you look at the trajectory of you know any number of people of color who have been employed uh, by the military, they took on supporting roles throughout the early part of American history. Those who were uh, you know those who were serving in a military capacity, it was tangential to the troops on the front lines. You yeah. know, occasionally you would have militias who would have you know freed. Uh, you know, who would have uh, free troops, and even during the uh, you know even during the Revolutionary War, you uh, had you had slaves who were encouraged to join the rebellion, and after so many months uh, or X amount of time in service, they would be allowed to uh, they'd be allowed to go free. Now, when you talk about uh, when you talk about getting a wider spread, although still segregated presence. Uh, within the military that really starts with the Buffalo soldiers. And this is right in the aftermath of, uh, this is in the aftermath of the civil war. Now throughout the civil war, of course, you know, you did have black regiments. Um, you know, you had, uh, you had what was called the United States color troops and they performed admirably, but it was still within a very limited purview. It was, you know, you have a segregated regiment here, you have uh, a segregated regiment there and uh the uh the troops of course were black 
but uh, the senior officers were all white. Mm. And that was a dynamic that carried forward a lot. Now, now, and after- I'm going to guess that they weren't in the Confederate side, right? They're going to be mostly on the north on on the um you know the union that they they're, they're going to be on that side right or am i wrong on that they, they are predominantly on the union side yeah okay yeah, yeah. Now, i'm just making sure like, you never know <laughs> yeah. you never know if there was like somebody else going yeah you know but, but i i've had some weird conversations with people over time so i just bringing that up so we go from the civil war into the buffalo soldiers so you had colored troops, so at that point, that's what they were called, colored, colored regiments, right? Right, and, then and into- yeah, it, it, it's it's uh, also kind of interesting to see how the vernacular changes over time. Yeah, because, I was say, uh, because yeah. at the time, the accepted vernacular to um, to say to a black person was they were a person of color. They were colored. You could either say colored or you you could say negro. It was actually offensive to call a black person black at that time it's like if you you know i mean now of course you know if i'm describing a uh if i'm describing a friend and he's black and someone asked me to describe what this particular person looks like that would be my first go-to i could be like okay well he's black you know he's about this tall and uh you know he uh you know he's a big fan of ralph lauren you know you typically see him we're wearing a polo shirt or whatever but, you know, as I'm given the physical description of a person, I, I wouldn't think twice about, you know, when I'm describing the color of that person's skin to say it's black. And mm-hmm. you and I today probably don't think anything of it, but it wasn't too long ago in human history where that was considered a really big no-no word. Now, uh, now all of these, uh, all of these regiments of colored troops, uh, you know, after the Civil War, they really, they really obtained the, uh, they obtained the designation Buffalo Soldiers only as we closed out the frontier and we started to uh, we started to really tie up all the loose ends with westward expansion. So starting in 1866, just one year after the Civil War ended, you know you had a lot of these colored regiments that were going out west to occupy these uh, forts along the frontier, and it was uh, some of these colored regiments who had their first interaction with native Americans out there. And a lot of these, you know, tribes were still very much in their heyday at the time. And it was the first time a, that uh, these black soldiers had seen a native American up close. And uh, you know, for the uh, tribes out there, you know, like the Sioux, the Lakota, Mm -hmm. um, it was the first time they had seen a black person. Now, they had seen white people in passing, of course. You know, they they had had any number of uh, interactions with uh, uh, with white folks, but uh, seeing a black person for the first time really took them aback. And when they first met, when they first met black people, they actually tried to uh, they tried to take rags to their skin because they thought that uh, they thought that they they thought that this was a person who was covered in soot or something. Whoa. But then, yeah, but then they realized very quickly. Oh no, that it, it, that, that that is actually the uh, that's actually the natural color of their skin. And uh, further to that, they took a look at the stature of uh, you know, and they, they took a look at the physical appearance of uh, these black soldiers. And the reason why they started calling them buffalo soldiers was because one they had the deep dark eyes that reminded them of the buffalo and they also had the curly mane that reminded them of the buffalo's uh, fur so uh, a lot of the native americans convinced themselves that these black soldiers were all of the dead buffalo come back to life as men wow and, i had no uh, idea yeah, about this yeah and that was where the term buffalo soldier came from so so uh, upon these first meetings uh the the native americans uh, had a had a very special reverence for all of these black soldiers because they said, okay, well, here is an example of the circle of life. You know, we we kill the buffalo on the open plains to you know supply our food and to uh, to also clothe ourselves. And now the spirit of the buffalo has have come back as men. Hmm. Yeah. Wow, I I had no idea. Always wondered why they were called the Buffalo Soldiers. Yet we're now not supposed to say bison. We have to say the animal Buffalo is bison. Right. Well, yeah. 
I mean, I think it's, I, I, I think it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. It's so weird, man. It's like, and now even when we say black history, I'm like, I do have like a weird, like, do I say that, you know, yeah. um, African American history, but then look, you know, there's, you know, black people here from different countries and, and right. islands that, you know, it's just different. And I just, you know, people are who they are. Like what you're saying, it's like, well, oh, you want to know their color. To me, I'll talk about a friend and it's not um, their color necessarily. You know, it's it's like, right. oh, I have this friend over here. Oh, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, but we've, we've had to go through these big stages in life, but we keep circling back to some weird stuff, right? Our history recycles. Uh, mm -hmm. It's my new word on history. We recycle, I think. And we keep you know, these cycles going, but, uh, to keep on with the, the, um, work of the African Americans and also the black history. And I think black history is that do, black history is supposed to be about black history month, right? Because African American, it's like, it's almost like you were forced to be American. So maybe black history is better than saying African American history. I don't know. Um, Could be. I don't, um, I don't know. Yeah, but I, I mean, oh. that is the official term for it. I mean, it's always been officially called Black History Month. It, yeah, it, it's it, it it's all, always been called Black History Month. I mean, it hasn't mm. been anything else. Um, you know, and uh, you know, there yeah. are even official sites and even official oh, organizations yeah. that have the title Black mm. in it. You know, and Black mm. is used to describe you know someone who is a person of color, someone who is of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of African ancestry. Mm. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's interesting, you know, um, to how we have to do all that <laughs> as human beings. We have to all just put everything in boxes, right? We're the blend, Mike. <laughs> yeah. We're the blend. We like to like, you know, cross lines and, and do things and, and because we always see connectivity. You know what I mean? We, we're more about connectivity of subjects. Like if you're interested in history, you may watch a really good movie that has history in it, but you would never maybe go watch the movie if it was promoted as history, right? But then you watch the movie and you're like, ooh, that was really cool. Well, you learned a whole bunch of history in it or read your book, you know? So that's yeah. how we are. We're like sneaky, sneak attack, <laughs> you know? So black history, Buffalo soldiers. So here are these Buffalo soldiers. Um, okay. So this is right after the civil war. Mm -hmm. Okay. So where are we on the timeline? We got the civil war and then here comes world war one, right? That's right. Am I getting this right? Am I getting this right? You know? Well, um, and yeah. So there is world war one that's on the horizon. Um, you know, really uh, the, the Buffalo soldiers start to make a name for themselves in the, Indian Wars of the American West. Um, yeah, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, throughout those Indian Wars, you know, throughout uh, throughout the 1860s, really until the early 1890s, um, you know, with, with the various uh, skirmishes that we were having out uh, out west with uh, out west with the Native Americans, you had uh, 23 Buffalo soldiers who were cited for the Medal of Honor. Yeah. And, uh, and then again, you had Buffalo soldiers who served in the Spanish American war. Wow. Yeah. Uh, wow. That's right. That's right. It's because it didn't Charles Young was, he wasn't he involved in one of those. Charles Young was, he was our first, uh, African American superintendent of the national park system. Yeah. And he did find in those wars. He did, he was a Buffalo soldier, but that's what, is that why we see so much Buffalo soldier history in the Southwest? Is because right. of those wars? That's right. Okay. That makes sense now because I always wondered about that. So I was like, at that time, how many black people were really living, you know, in the West? Yet, you will find history like in the town we lived in, in Julian, California, up in the mountains in San Diego. There mm -hmm. was a lady called America. And she, she... There's actually a bed and breakfast. I, I don't know if it's a bed and breakfast to this day because things change. Um, but at that point, this was her house. And she had the laundromat. She was a laundry lady for the miners. And she built a business. And she had this whole, you know, this it, 
she has this whole legacy. But how did she get there from the South? You know what I mean? And yet that town was founded by Confederate soldiers, right. the Baileys that came out West. And um, one settled Palomar Mountain. And we actually know the descendants of the family and they created, they actually settled the town. Crazy history. But um, it's, it's interesting to, to see that because you see Buffalo soldier history throughout the West and you're going in the Southwest, like, how and why did they get that far during the Civil War? How did they get here and why? You know what I mean? It, because right. when you think about them coming, you know, as slaves, they weren't coming in through San Diego. Though they might have preferred it. <laughs> I don't know. You know what I mean? They weren't coming through the port of San Diego or San Francisco at the time, right? As slaves, you know, but they were coming in from the East Coast, right? Am I right on this? Am I getting it screwed up? Did they come in through Texas at all in the ports there when, when they were bringing slaves in? Uh, through the ports of Texas? Well, for the, for the transatlantic slave trade, it was mostly the Caribbean. Those were their first ports of call. It was to the Caribbean and it was to the East Coast. If uh, any of them got to the Texas ports, it was usually by way of, you know, um, e- either it was, it was by way of, any any number of the Caribbean islands. Privateering, too. Yeah. No, no. yeah, okay. So going west would be the Buffalo Soldiers then. But mm-hmm. I don't know how, how... I have to look up how America got there now. Now I'm going to have to go back on her history. Because, yeah, I mean, how did the black women get there? You know? I don't... I wonder if people that were going west brought them across what what do you think uh, i mean now i'm totally like now i'm gonna this is a rabbit hole mike <laughs> see what you started uh-huh. rabbit hole but <laughs> yeah i mean when you think about single women single black women going across into the far west that's pretty unique in the yeah, 1800s yeah well yeah. Th- yeah and that's actually uh that's actually a a very clever segue into how one particular black woman uh, was able to disguise herself as a man and ride alongside the Buffalo soldiers. So uh, there was a, uh, there was a woman whose name was Kathy Williams. She, uh, you know, as she uh, just cut her hair short and uh, enlisted in the Buffalo soldiers, disguising herself as a man and, uh, and uh, told the, uh, told the recruiter that her name was William Cathay. And, yeah, she was able to uh, successfully uh, successfully fool her comrades that uh, she was a man until, of course, she was eventually found out. But uh, yeah, so you see, there's uh, there's there's oh, that wow. interesting anecdote that lies within the whole context of these of uh, these single black women who move out west. Yeah, I mean, you look at her, you know, the pictures they have of her, and everyone's C A T H A Y, right? That one, that mm-hmm. she was born in Independence, Missouri, where we've been. No way. She's on the Jefferson Highway. Um, so she decided that's my way out, mm-hmm. basically. Right? That's wow. Right. So women, oh, this is okay, Mike. We're going to, you know, now that's a rabbit hole. Sorry. Uh, okay. You know, I'm going to be sending you emails, right, of other things that we have to talk about on future shows. So she becomes part of that. Then, okay, so World War comes, World War One comes in, Buffalo Soldiers, Spanish Wars, all of this happens. Got the Mexican-American War, right? Uh, well, the Mexican-American oh, War was the 1840s. So, but yeah, we have, um, we have, we have the, uh, then. Oh, that was before. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so then, I gotta yeah. get my, I gotta twirl myself around here. Yeah. It's hard yeah. to get it all in yeah. place. Yes. So, so then, of course, you have World War One, and then World War Two. Uh, you know, you have uh, you have an expansion of America's armed forces at that point, and uh, a lot of a lot of black soldiers are signing up. And there's a uh, there's a movement within you know the uh, the um, I guess you can say the smallest strands of the civil rights movement because you know, the steam that uh, that that had been gathered throughout the 1890s and the early 1900s for civil rights, you know, with guys like Booker T. Washington and uh, also Marcus Garvey, 
uh, it, it had kind of uh, stalled with the onset of the Depression. But when World War II came along, there were a lot of African Americans who enlisted uh, in the armed forces. And uh, there was a there was an unofficial slogan that said it was going to be it w- was going to be victory on two fronts that, you know, we were going to have victory overseas and we were going to defeat the forces of fascism and, uh, you know, the uh, the brutal crimes against humanity that that the Nazis uh, that the Nazis represented. And then at the same time, while seeing how well black soldiers and black officers uh performed overseas it was going to lead to victory on the home front and then that would spell the end of many generations of racial bigotry well didn't quite play out that way but they did end up desegregating the armed forces in 1948 where wherein black soldiers and white soldiers could serve alongside one another and i think that was a, a critical point in American racial history, because from that point forward, you would see a lot of black recruits who would use the military as a means of upward mobility. Mm. But uh, if you look at uh, if uh, you look back to World War II proper, even those segregated divisions um, uh, that we had, be it a segregated division or a unit of any size, really, uh, they still performed very admirably and uh, still had a, a very admirable track record. There are two uh, two particular um, organizations that come to mind. Um, one was the 92nd Infantry Division, uh, not coincidentally mm. called the Buffalo Division because of oh, its wow. linkage to the Buffalo Soldiers who uh, served in the Italian campaign, and uh, and they, uh, they they did so with, with much distinction. And then, of course, you also had the uh, you also had the, the famous Tuskegee Airmen, who were the uh, yes. black pilots who were trained. And uh, there's a uh, there's a somewhat recent well, I say recent. It's actually 12 years ago now. But uh, but if uh, any listeners out there are familiar with the 2012 movie Red Tails, uh, an incredibly powerful film uh, that followed uh, that followed the story of a fighter pilot unit that was part of the Tuskegee Airmen and uh, mm-hmm. their, uh, their struggles <laughs> in the war uh, in the, uh, you know, in, in, in the later stages of the ETO, because you can see how uh, these were, these were very conscientious and very dedicated pilots who, uh, you know, despite the uh, constraints that were put on them still uh, performed very admirably and uh, did so with a very, very good attitude you know the uh, film starts with uh these black soldiers this is this is 1944 i believe and uh at this point in the war these uh these these black pilots are uh flying hand me down airplanes they're still flying p40s even though uh p40 at this point in the war uh, has already been deemed a much inferior plane and and uh it's very easy fodder for any number of axis fighters and not only that uh, they're kept on aerial patrol routes that are that are deliberately far away from uh, deliberately far away from where the real action is. Well, throughout the course of the movie, uh, th- despite all these handicaps, the the black pilots proved themselves to be very combat effective, and uh, they ended up swapping out their P40s for P51s, which were you know the top dog Allied fighter at the time, and uh, you know they proved themselves in uh, combat against uh, against. Um, mm-hmm pilots of the Luftwaffe and uh, not only that they earned the respect and admiration of their white comrades because uh, these uh, these red tail pilots as they call them uh, they were uh, they were they were flying bomber escort missions for these uh, b-25s and b-17s who were carpet bombing uh, mainland Europe they were badass I mean yeah. really when you look at the Tuskegee airmen and then when they went over into mm-hmm. Europe right they had days off like in France and stuff then, you know, people were treating them normal, as right. normal human beings versus what they were getting treated in our country. Mm-hmm. And isn't that the truth? Like for them, they, they, that was part of almost them having some vindication of civil rights. Right. You know, when you look at slavery and that history, and I've done like a, a quite a few interesting interviews lately on people raised in really bad circumstances, cults, religious cults and things lately. Yeah. And 
when you are, you know, okay, so if you come in as a slave, you know it's bad. You're already going through, you've gone through this, you know, sailing on the ship, which was horrible. Then you get here and it's horrible, right? But then you're, you know, maybe a child into, you know, born into slavery. And that's part of what you know. And you're so closed off to the rest of the world as a slave you know, and the lack of education and all of that, right? It's almost like a cult weird thing. Like, I don't, you know what, do you know what I mean, Mike? And yeah. so once here's these, you know, men and women were also part of the Tuskegee Airmen movement, right? Um, I want to touch on that too. They go overseas and they're accepted and they're like, well, hell, that's not happening in my town. You know what I mean? So it had to be like part of an enlightening part for the civil rights movement to come home, right? Do you think that helped at all? I was just thinking as you were talking about it, like, wow, that had to have happened. Yeah. You know, when you think about World War II and then we got into Vietnam and we'll get into that in a second, but did, do you think it helped that they knew that other countries cared? Yeah, yeah, I think it did. I think on I think on some level it just helped fuel the fire that uh put us on that road to what would ultimately become the civil rights movement. You know, I wow. think that uh I think that they were able to uh have another data point where they were welcomed, you know, fully as equals where uh for the majority of the population the color of their skin was really neither here nor there. I mean, it wasn't even mm-hmm. a factor at all. Yeah, no, not at all. People didn't even yeah. think. Yeah. It was like, you're just a human being, right. which they are. But at, and when you think about slavery days and the history, they were, you know, hey, you're livestock, you know, so were women a lot of times. Um, but moving forward into Tuskegee Airmen, you know, this is part of our, our, um, George Washington Carver is like a hero of mine, like, mm-hmm. um, as an educator, a pioneer, it, you know, when we talk about the blend, it's about not, you know, have a strong focus in your life, right? But don't, don't be too much of a rhino, you know, understand things around you. And I think he was one of those men that did that. And um, he taught at Tuskegee and at the Institute there. And um, the Airman National Historic Site is part of our uh, history, uh, our National Park Service history and historic sites. But what I was reading is it was about African Americans, Native Americans, Caribbean Islanders, Latinos, and men and women of mixed racial heritage right. that were tested and trained to see if they could fill positions as pilots, technicians, radio operators, parachute riggers, control tower operators, and more. So there were women that worked side by side like the Rosie the Rid of Riveters in Tuskegee, right? Am I right with this? No oh, yeah. Yeah. The every Rosie the Riveter, yeah, they uh they, they you had a uh, you 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 didn't have any workplace segregation. Wow. So this was a huge part too. So the women of Tuskegee were part of that movement. But mm-hmm. we always think of Rosie the white woman, but the, I know we talked about Rosie the Riveter a few months ago. But I'm just saying, um, but am I right that before 1940, African-Americans were not allowed to even fly for the U.S. military? Uh, Yeah, it was uh, it 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 really didn't come into uh, its own until World War Two proper, uh, because I mean, it was it was um, and there were a number of medical reasons or excuse me, pseudo medical reasons why. uh, Oh, why um why african americans oh. were discouraged from flying they said you know uh you know black pilots would have very bad night vision um you know their their bodies couldn't handle this or that of the aerodynamics of the uh, of the plane i mean they oh were God. you know yeah they were these uh i can oh they were really just inspired by eugenics <laughs> but, yeah i was going to say eugenics right when yeah. when i was in school in south africa all right, so South Africa has um, a – not everyone that's why it's bad, okay? But yeah. there's like a faction that is. And one of my teachers was. And um, 
he made us put a, I was probably, oh, I'd say about nine or 10 years old, 10, 11, uh, maybe 12. I don't know. But I had a brain. Like, you know, I was questioning everything. And we had like some workbook and we were supposed to color in a volcano or something. And I didn't do it. And something happened. And I think I was sick or something. And we had parents night. Right. And Nancy goes in and this is never good because she's still American. <laughs> my, like I'm an American. I can take my kid and do whatever I want. And we, we learned later. You can't be like that in Africa. Right. But um, this guy had um, smacked a teacher's desk into the, and uh, not, not the teacher's desk, but remember those old school desks where you had, you could lift up the, the wooden thing and you could put your books in it, you know, yeah. old school. Not I don't cool. know if they have them now. Well, he lifted it up and smacked it on this kid's head for not doing mm-hmm. his volcano. I didn't do my volcano. And um, this teacher also taught us, sat in class, a history lesson of black people and how they can't do things that white people can because of the fissures in their brain being too separated. They can't swim. They can't do this. They can't do that. And I went back home. Mommy, mommy, what the hell is he talking about? And Nancy's like, what? You know, because I was raised in with a couple of black tribes and when I was a young, young child and, you know, and I'm like, I know these people can like, y- you want to see somebody hunt? Like you, you take these people out and they'll, they'll in swim. I know people who can go under water and track a wild, track wildlife underwater. Like, what are you talking about? And this guy, I mean, he did get eventually fired. Um, and it was a huge thing. Yeah, I was younger. I, I was more 12 years old. Like when I think back, because he went against girls who are having their period. It was bad. Like in, in PE and it was really, really bad. And he did get eventually taken out. Nancy was a loud mouth and you need that. But that's what was happening in the eighties, early eighties, whatever age I was at that point. I don't know, but that happened. And that was this belief system that was going around. But you've got to think that went all the way to the 80s. But I know that was Africa. So that's different. But that was what was going around in this country at that time, right? Yeah. That's crazy. (laughs) It's crazy. It was crazy to be part of it. Like, it was crazy. Like, I remember as a kid just sitting up like, what the hell are you talking about, dude? You know, like, there's no way I I, like I all I knew is like, I know black people will take you out right now. And they're smarter than you. You know, it was so weird to sit in that position as a kid and not know what to do. You know what I mean? Like, you don't know, because you're supposed to not question the teacher. You're not supposed, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's a very weird place to be. And I, I, so thankful that we're in a place now where we can question, communicate, and hopefully it can be done in a more positive way than a lot of times of what it's done. But um, that's as close as I can get. Like, well, other than some other weird stuff in Africa and, and you know apartheid and all of that. But and I'm not saying all of that like flippantly at all. It just, wow, wow. So that was ha- so South Africa was going through that, but that was happening here, and it was happening in the military. So you could have had more black pilots in World War One and soldiers in World War One if it wasn't for all that belief system. Am I right on that? Yeah. I mean, had had we not been so hung up on segregation and all the pseudoscience, yeah, we we could have had a we 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 could have had a so much more. Wow. Okay. So let's move forward. So World War Two, we've got the Tuskegee Airmen and women. Got to bring them in. Mike, you're getting me upset <laughs> just <laughs> thinking about it all. Right. That's um, it. I know. Sorry about that. History is allowed to make us move a little bit, right? Isn't that part mm-hmm. of why you write? That's right. Um, when when you were doing research uh, for your book, The Combat Diaries, mm-hmm. True Stories from the Front Lines of World War II, did you come across any black uh, pilots, military men, combat soldiers 
or stories, um, you know, that you stood up to you that, you know, uh, no, but, uh, in a, uh, in a sequel to the combat diaries, I, I do want to, uh, I do want to have a, uh, volume. I mean, the combat diaries, I do intend to be a multi-volume set. Um, one, uh, you know, one of the, uh, one of the successive volumes, uh, s- sequels, I want to, uh, focus on the, the contributions of, uh, troops who fought in segregated units. I want to, uh, call attention to, uh, you know, black fighter pilots and the Tuskegee Airmen, you know, the, mm-hmm. uh, the segregated, uh, infantry and armored regiments who, uh, you know, who really, uh, who really, who really stuck it to the axis. Mm-hmm. I, I can't wait. I can't wait because I love that you do that in, and also fire in the hole tales of combat with the first engineer battalion in Vietnam that is out now. That's your latest book. Any, did you come across any black history in, in that book, which was really about uh, the Vietnam and you, you touch on Korea too. I mean, Korea came, the Korean war came first, but um, any black history in that when you were doing your research? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I wouldn't say black history per se, but, uh, but definitely the contributions of black soldiers. Um, you know, those who, uh, you know, those who were willing to fight at this point who were not drafted. I mean, we're not talking about draftees. We're talking about, uh, you know, longstanding, um, soldiers who had some time and rank by the time Vietnam kicked off, you know, who, uh, you know, who went over there and, uh, willingly fought for their country. Even at a time when, uh, you know, the civil rights movement had reached critical mass and, uh, it was, uh, you know, it, it's almost, it's almost a, uh, a point in time where, where if you are a person of color, no matter what you do or what you don't do, you're going to be drawing some criticism and fire from somebody because if you are patriotic and you are going over to Vietnam to fight for your country, well, then the uh, the more militant uh, fellow blacks who are in the civil rights movement are uh, saying that you're selling out or that you're uh, that you're blind to the uh, you know true plight of what the black community is. But if you uh, you know if you uh, if you do join the civil rights movement as a uh, you know as an activist of any of any sort, you know if you're if you're a militant, then you're criticized for being violent. If you're more of the civil disobedience stripe, you know, like what MLK espoused, well, then you're, you know, too much of a, you know, you're too much of a patsy. And if you, wow. uh, if you try to keep your head to the ground and not really take sides and just see how things shake out, well, then you're not only a patsy, you're, you're also a coward. Uh, you know, and if you, uh, if you just try to say, well, Hey, you know, I, I support our troops in Vietnam, and, uh, you know, but I also support uh, integration of all races across the board, then you're somebody who refuses to take sides. So no matter what you do or don't do, you're going to be drawn fire from somebody. Somebody's going to criticize you <laughs> about uh, about any path you take or no path that you take. Or somebody's just not going to like you because you have a you have a darker shade of skin. So it was, a, it was I, I, I can only imagine a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the existential reflections and, uh, and inner conflicts that, uh, African Americans yeah. had at that time. Cause yeah, it's like, I what, know. what exactly yeah. do you do? Because, you know, when you think about Martin Luther King Jr., I know I even sent you a message, like, what are we going to do? You know, he was all about nonviolence, right? And, mm-hmm. um, change through nonviolence, which I absolutely 100% support. It's altruistic, right? In a yeah. way. But wouldn't it be great? And can we aspire to that? Wouldn't, mm-hmm. you know, so can we touch on that a second? Because at the end of the day, you, you can't not have a military. You can't not in the country as big as America. It's a huge country and it is, it does get targeted for things and you can't have and non, I mean, there's some countries that have no defense, but I think it's going to change over time. I don't know, but um, there's a couple countries. I think, like, isn't it Switzerland and maybe Costa Rica that, um, or a, eh, maybe not Costa Rica. I don't know. Yeah, that, well, Costa Rica is one of the few countries on, in Latin America that doesn't have a standing army. They abolished their army back in the late 1940s, and uh, 
Yeah, they uh, they have not reinstituted it ever since. And uh, mm-hmm. Iceland, they they don't have a standing army, but they do have a uh, they do have a we- they they have a weaponized coast guard. Okay, that and, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, but it's so it's weird. But like, I don't think America could ever do that. We're not that small to be able to mm-hmm. do that. But and it doesn't make sense for our country. But I mean. I'm not going against, you know, MLK's, you know, he he was trying to do nonviolent change. Mm-hmm. It wasn't necessarily anti, well, he did go against the Vietnam War, right? He did do that. Um, he was, I, yeah, he, yeah, he was, he was very Pretty much damn vocal about it. Vietnam. Yeah. Um, but I think he was really just trying to do like the nonviolent thing. He just mm-hmm. was like, can we have peace? You know, um, and he was also very young. He was also a very young man before, you know, he was shot, what, in his early 30s when he was assassinated? Um, he was young. Yeah, he was, um, uh, yeah, late. He was assassinated in his late 30s. Yeah, I think. Yeah, it was, that's yeah. pretty young. You know, when you think about it, you really have these ideals and you're trying to make a peace movement. You can't, when you're trying to do a peace movement, in that way that he was doing. You can't be peace here, but not there. You know what I mean? So right. it's kind of a, it's a, it, yeah, it, but history is history. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I, I don't think peace is wrong. And I don't think people in the military are there to, to destroy. And I think that's something I wanted to touch on with you. Um, and that's something important we touch on about Vietnam every time, you know, um, after World War One, we thought that World War thing was over. And then right. World War Two happened, and we're like, okay, it's really over. And then, hell, here comes Korea, and then here comes Vietnam, right? So this is when these patterns start to happen, and then you've got Desert Storm and all of that, right? So here comes these patterns. And so that, I think, I think Vietnam was just like, where are we going with this? I think everyone was questioning at that time. I was not personally there. Um, but what do you think about that kind of idea of it? Because people are against it. Yeah, we all want peace. And I think what I want people to understand too is, don't you think everyone fighting really wanted peace too? And that's what they were doing, right? Yeah. Well, you know, it goes back into that, old way of thinking you know hey you uh you know if you uh you want peace you have to you have to be prepared to fight you have to be prepared to fight for it you uh you pray for peace but you prepare for war because when everything else fails you know war is the uh war is the war's the last answer that's how you reestablish the peace mm. it it sucks <laughs> it yeah. has to go there right i mean right. i don't think anybody really wants to go to war and there's, there's people that do, that they, they have that thing, but I don't, you know, don't we all kind of want to have a nice life, you know, right. but humans are humans and we do human crap that, you know, and you cannot sit on your laurels and hope to hell and wish and pray and play law of attraction on, on enemies. <laughs> you can't, I'm sorry, not trying to be rude about all that stuff, but come on. You can't, you know, when people are going to come out and bomb you, you better get your butt up and go, you know, Mm -hmm. you can't, you cannot sit and close. You can't have your head in the sand is my point. No, I'm just saying, um, Vietnam was weird. Korea was weird. I think Vietnam, why does Korea get so closed off? Why do we never talk about it? What is that? Well, I think it's because it's sandwiched between two really big bookends. On on one side, you have World War II. I mean, which you know is the, the the greatest conflict in human history uh, gets all the press, and uh, you know was a it was a it was a terrific outcome for the Allied forces. You know, we defeated Nazism. Uh, you know, and then we came back. You know, to a post war economic boom, and we had the baby boomers. So everyone's uh, quite euphoric over World War II. And then on the other bookend, you have Vietnam, which, you know, was, uh, which, uh, is a scar for many of us. So, you know, you have the greatest conflict of all time or the greatest conflict of human history, at least. Uh, and then on the other side, you have what's, you know, just the worst of the worst human conflicts. And then, 
you know, I guess Korea in a sense, and I'm not saying this to be to be flippant or you know sardonic, but mm -hmm. it's just a, an analogy that that I think of. It, it's uh, you know, it's your, I think it's your historical uh, case study of the middle child syndrome. You know, it's the uh, one in between the uh, one in between the two bookends that really tends to be overlooked or not given as much attention as it should. Mm. And, you know, the, uh, because the, I mean, it was of course in the headlines, uh, quite a bit, but, you know, we, we didn't really feel the sting. What we weren't put on, you know, the total war footing where, you know, we have to ration everything like we did during World War II. And mm. at the same time, it didn't have the uh, big controversy or the, uh, you know, political and social backlash that Vietnam did. You know, it was like some, it was a war we knew we were fighting. You know, we would, you know, we would hear about it on uh, on the evening news and, you know, we would read about it in the newspaper and we knew that a few folks were getting drafted. But, uh, you know, it, it wasn't something that occupied our daily lives. It, it didn't have the same level of threat or immediacy that World War II did. And when those veterans came back, they were pretty much ignored. You know, I mean, mm. they're... Yeah, you, they came back from Korea and it's like, okay, well, you know, thank you for your service and uh, you done did good over there. Now uh, go find Here's your cup of coffee at the diner. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's touch on that. So this happens in Korea. So Vietnam time, you got to think, okay, it's MLK time. Um, Korea, did we have many black soldiers from America fighting in Korea? Oh yeah, yeah, we had quite a few. I mean, that not uh not to the extent that we would get in later years, but you know, now we had fully integrated units and and uh yeah, there were there were quite a few black soldiers over there. Mm -hmm. And then and then again in Vietnam because now people are being drafted, right? So that becomes a was that where like the would in Korea if, if someone signed up for the military and went to fight then and it wasn't in he wasn't because we I don't remember any black women fighting at that time. So if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Sorry. Uh, let me know. Um, but if a black person stood up and said, OK, I'm going to go fight in Korea. I want to go put myself in the Army, Navy, military, whatever unit going in. Um, was that controversial at that time for them to do it? Well, not necessarily controversial for them to join no um but it was still something that a lot of uh, uh that a lot of people were trying to get used to you know it, it i mean you could oh. be a person of color and join the military and uh that uh that was um in a lot of ways that was that was expected of any American to do at that point, whether they were black or white. But the fact that you were going into a now fully desegregated armed forces, that was something a lot of people both in and out of the military were trying to get used to. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for for many, I suspect it was really a non-issue. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because you live in communities together a lot right. of times, small towns, right. right? You know each other, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and... And, uh, you know, it was just there, you still had people who would, who were clinging to those old notions of, well, you know, there's the white culture, there's the black culture. They should be, yeah. uh, be separated, you know, wherever they are. But, you know, th there, there were, there were numerous growing pains, you know, of, uh, you know, folks who just wanted to, um, I wanted to <laughs> cling to the so old the ways and not, not accept any person, uh, of color, you know, no matter what that color might be, they didn't want to, you know, yeah within the uh within the country. yeah if you're asia or yeah. You're, yeah if you're indian you're you know chinese you know mm -hmm. oh if you're chinese you're out you know that mm -hmm. you know that's how it's been you know so tuskegee airmen are there they show themselves off but how much of the country i mean we think about our media and communications now so we know about tuskegee airmen movies like you were you were talking about do you think back then by the time korea happened that people understood everybody about the Tuskegee Airmen was, was did people know that they were part of the hero system? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, okay, cool. That's people, cool. A lot of people knew. Um, no, the, the, a lot of people knew, I, I, I guess the, uh, I guess the more direct question would be, did those who know, did they care? <laughs> 
did they uh you know did they use it as a uh did they use it as a data point for us to say wow you know we really had it wrong and you know we we should welcome you know we should welcome black soldiers black officers back you know, or mm-hmm. black pilots or what have you as equals or did some of them take the mindset well i don't care what they did uh you know as part of the tuskegee airmen i still don't want them around here you, you just mm-hmm. keep them s- segregated if they did so well well they can continue to do well in their own unit and period <laughs> what what when you served in the army did you have you know a multiracial group that you oh, served of with Oh, of course. Yeah. I, I had, uh, yeah, I had black soldiers, white soldiers, uh, um, Hispanics, um, Asians, Asians of every stripe. You know, it could be a Japanese soldier, it could be a Filipino, it could be a uh, Pacific Islander. Um, and, and, and is that weird knowing all the history, right? Of the, you know, we've talked about like, you know, you know, if you got in, caught in a POW camp with the Japanese, you're screwed, right? Back in the day. So, now you're serving with them. Like, is that going through your head going, don't you get me? You know, like mm-hmm. I'm, I, and I, I'm not saying that to be an idiot. I'm saying it like, does that history hit home for soldiers going in and going, or at this point in our lives now, are we going, that was history. Let's move forward. Yeah. I, I, I never, I never detected. I never saw any instances of, uh, of racism. Um, you know, I, you know, throughout every unit that I served in, you know, people of uh, awesome. every color, every shade of skin, oh, every nice. variant, every hybrid of race, you know, we, we all got along just fine. You know, we, uh, you know, to, to, um, to us soldiers who were serving, it was really a non-issue. And there was a, uh, there was a meme that I posted quite a few years ago. It was a, uh, it was it was such a powerful message and it was so simple. There was, th- th- there was no picture to the meme, but uh, it was describing the experience that a lot of soldiers had. It was just this message and I'll paraphrase it because, you know, it, it just says in any typical army barracks, you know, you'll have your Southern boy who's getting cha-cha lessons from, from a, a Puerto Rican soldier. Mm-hmm. You, know, you have a Russian soldier who's, who's or, or a Russian American uh, soldier who's mm-hmm. uh, you know, teaching a, uh, you know, teaching his black friend, you know, how to, uh, how to mix vodka, you know, mm-hmm. you have, uh, you know, then you have your, uh, Chinese, uh, soldier who is, uh, you know, who is introducing his, uh, white soldier friend to, you know, his, uh, his sister who, who starts dating. And, you know, then you have a, uh, then you have a Mexican soldier who's, you know, trying to, uh, you know, who's, uh, who's teaching his, um, who's teaching his Asian friend how to make, uh, you know, how to make, uh, how, how to make frijoles. And we're all just sitting around wondering why is anybody outside of these barracks? Why would they ever be racist? You know? Yeah. Right. Isn't that it? That I think that's it. That's it. I love this conversation. This is one of my favorite conversations with you because I think, you know, I grew up in a way where I was the outsider and I was the token of, um, put downs because I was white, Mm. you know? So it was a whole different set, but it was young kid, kids and kids get along. But if you're the only white person that they've ever seen, you're the weird one. They are like, what the hell is that? And then, you know, things happen, but we got along because we had to, we had to do things. We had work to do. We had stuff to do as kids. Trust me. Um, and we had to play and playtime is big, but. You know, that's the thing, you know, when, when you get down into thinking of the trenches of Vietnam or World War II, Korea, um, you don't have time for that other crap that the world, right. I almost feel like racism is laziness mm-hmm. in a weird way. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, for sure it does. You can sit on your couch, watch the TV and not know a damn thing because you're sitting on your couch drinking your beer and not getting out there in the world and experiencing people and what goes on. You know, I think it's important that people do go to um, military monuments celebrating those who have passed and those who are serving now to actually read all the names. And you know what's interesting? It doesn't always talk about white, black or anything. It's like these are the names. These are the people, you know. Right. You may know by the name, but you might be wrong. You don't know if someone was adopted or not. You don't know. 
Look them up. Look them up just for the heck of it. Look up those people that come from your town. You know, um, it's very important. Uh, before you go, I know we, we've gone over time here. Um, God, that's a shock. Um, <laughs> there's a, two leaders we wanted to talk about on the show today. Colin Powell. Yes. That he was huge, man. He was. I mean, he was there. big when we got to this country. Um, it's all you heard. He was really, um, and I don't know how to explain his career because then it was like, wasn't he under the Republicans or whatever? Do we do we care? Like what side he was on? You no, know, people I mean, go Republican, this, yeah. that. I don't really care, yeah, really. Yeah. I mean, Democrat he, uh, or not, right? You know? And you know, I and I'm I neither, say, by the way, everybody. Just so you don't pick on me, right. I'm neither. I'm one of those. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, here, here's what I have to say about Colin Powell. You know, uh, he was a great man who accomplished a lot during his lifetime. Uh, I think he was a force for good for the black community. I think he was a positive role model. I think he was a positive role model to blacks everywhere. Now, uh, did he have his flaws? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, did he, uh, did he have his own private vices? Yeah. And, uh, was he always 100% right on the issues 100% of the time? No. Uh, but, you know, I think there can be little argument that guys like Colin Powell, you know, have, uh, just gone above and beyond in their lifetimes for what they were able to accomplish. You know, here was a, uh, you know, here was, um, uh, what I can only say was a very, was a very nice looking black man who as a young man, you know, decided that he wanted to, he wanted to join the military, wanted to serve his country, found something he was passionate about and, uh, you know, uh, got married to a very attractive lady and, uh, you know, raised a family, made sure that, uh, the kids had a two parent home and, uh, you know, was a very, he, he was a very, uh, he was a very nice and pleasant person to the people that he knew the people he worked with and those who worked for him. And I was able to uh, parlay that talent and that attitude into a successful career. And also, uh, you know, when, when coupled with a, uh, a brilliant mind and a, a brilliant thinker, yeah, it, it doesn't take, uh, it doesn't take too much to guess that he would excel in the arena of, of public service, you know, first, in his White House fellowship, and you know, then of course as uh, part of the uh, part of the Reagan White House, and then the uh, and then the Bush Forty One. That's right. White That's House. right. He was in Reagan time. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And, and, uh, he... Yeah. Yeah. And, and then of course, you know, um, and then of course being courted as a as a potential um, potential Republican uh, candidate for the presidency before he becomes Secretary of State under George W. Bush, first and Black he... Secretary of State. That's right. Hmm. Wow. So I didn't know that. I didn't even think he was being, you know, Ooh. so he really has this huge career, but also was very much um, the American dream in a way, you know, of the, you know, the family home, you know, everybody doing what you're supposed to do like that. Um, that American, I, you know, I, the American dream, I kind of feel is kind of weird now. Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah, he seemed to have done a lot and kind of went for it. He went for it. He and did. in and like you're saying, it's like Henry Kissinger, right? Wasn't all clean on things. Who is? Right. Who <laughs> who is? Who's perfect? Like it's humans. We're humans and humans do some really stupid things in time <laughs> and we make bad decisions all the time and you are allowed to fail. But you're also, if you're going to fail, you're allowed to get up and fix it. Right. Yep. Fail early, fail often, and fail forward. Always learn from those failures to propel yourself into doing something better. That's right. Fail forward fast, man. Get it over with quick. Just get the hell up, you know? How long? Yeah. You know, isn't that true? Like I was thinking about that in another interview um, today about some things that you can get down. And it could, it could be not necessarily a failure, Mm-hmm. You know, um, I was going back into the cult things and all of that I was telling you about earlier, you know, where you're closed off, you know, and how do you 
know when to break free of this stuff. When you start to know, oh, this is some messed up stuff, right? How do you break free of it? Like this emotional intelligence. I know I've talked to you a little bit about that before. Right. The emotional intelligence of it. Do you do, you have to be strategic. You have to wade water at times. Mm -hmm. Tread, wade, whatever. You gotta sit sometimes, jump sometimes. People may tell you jump now, but when you know you shouldn't and can't, don't. You know what I mean? You have to have that balance. It's weird. But when you fail, you want to go into this emotional little thing. You can't. You can do a thing. You're allowed your little, sometimes, not even a minute. Because you don't have the time. In military operation, you don't really have the time to be a baby. And I don't mean to be rude about that. You know, but victimhood is not a good thing right. unless it's going to teach you humility. Mm -hmm. Right. You know what I mean? Oh, that sounds really bad. That didn't sound right. That's not what I meant. It, you know what I mean though? It, um, oh, do you, do you know what I mean? I mean, isn't that something for military going out there and fighting that there is like a, I don't like to talk about victimhood because I don't like it. I don't like, I don't, you need to get up. <laughs> you know what I mean? The, what What do you say about that? And and humility is something. If you created a victimhood situation, that is part of humility, right? In, in my way off, you, you're allowed to give me hell, Mike, you know. Well, you know, I, I think, I think victimhood is only useful in the sense that if you are a victim of something, you use it as a springboard to try to make yourself better mm, and right. pick yourself up from it. Because, you know, I mean, there, there can be any number of people who are legit victims of mm -hmm. something terrible in their lives that happened, yeah. something that was unwarranted, not at all deserved, or, you know, whatever punishment they got didn't fit whatever small crime they may or may not have committed. But, you know, there are plenty of victims out there who are true victims of the things that happened to them and, uh, and, uh, certainly did nothing to warrant what was placed on them. But I think it, it only becomes useful in the sense that you use it as a frame of reference to say, I'm here. How can I make this situation better? How yeah. can I, yeah, how can I, uh, take all of this adversity and, and, uh, you know, uh, of course, I'm allowed to grieve. I'm allowed to be angry at uh, what happened. But is there any way forward from this? And is there anything I can accomplish on the tail end? And uh, and I, I know that sounds I know that sounds good as a broad concept. And I, I certainly know it's of a lot easier said than done. But uh, I think that's the. I think that's the best way you could quantify mm -hmm. victimhood mentality as something good. Just be, you just know that it's, it's a, uh, it's a way station. It's not a way of life. Temporary. It's a yeah, temporary, temporary place. It's yeah. that limbo land, right? That's right. what I'm saying. It's a, and humility is if you <clears throat> allow your humility, when I talk about humility is allowing yourself to go, okay, you let yourself be small at that time. It, because there's real victimhood, POWs, you know, prisoner of war, um, you know, child abuse, things like that. But what I have found is that a lot of people have gone through some kind of victimhood thing, stood up and said, screw you, uh, uh, I ain't doing this, and ended up in the military going, I'm going to take out people who don't do the right thing. Right. Like they've used that as part, like we talked about like Lee Marvin, right? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, there's just so many people, like so many people you have written about, it became their fire of, you know, but they had a humility too. That's it's right. weird. I, humility is a really weird word. I should never have brought it up, but it okay. is like humility is like you could go and realize, oh, you learn about yourself. I am still very small. I feel small at this time as a victim. But humility is also part of understanding you're part of a greater world and a greater place to be. And you're part of that good part, 
not necessarily victimhood. So it's that other transitory thing. Do you know what I mean? That sounds mm-hmm. so weird, but I, I mean it and sincerely. So, um, when I say humility, I'm not, it's not a put down ever. Like when yeah. you're in nature, you realize how small you are in the world, but you also realize how connected you are. Mm-hmm. That's what I mean. So let me just rephrase that. So you get that. Um, going into that, um, that is true about a lot of military uh, folk going into the military going, I'm going to better myself. And I think a lot of African-American people did that going like, hey, how am I going to get out of the hood, basically, you mm-hmm. know, and that was a way or out of a small town, you know, I, I mean, all colors did that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, all races, I should say, excuse me, you know, um, did that to get out of situations and know, hey, I'm serving. And I will say this. When you are doing something bigger than yourself, it's probably the biggest lesson you can do for yourself. Wouldn't yeah, you say? That's right. that's right. Yeah. I would agree. When people use the military, and I'm not saying they used the military, but went into the system of that, chose that profession for a period of time, said, hey, I'm going to go into this. This is a way for me to do this, to maybe better my life. Let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. I haven't yeah. been politically correct, have I? It's okay. Everybody send your emails. It doesn't really matter. You know what I mean. Um, when you meet those people, I know people who just go, look, it changed everything in my life. It was the best thing. I've met a couple that it didn't work well for them. Because it just didn't. But um, I think it is about sometimes when you're in a bad place in life, the first thing you do is you need to give back. And it's a weird thing when you're feeling low or down or bad or in a bad place. But if you give back, you start to become human again. Does that make sense? And I feel that, you know, and I know this is Black History Month and I'm not saying black people are down and out i'm just saying that it happens i'm just saying in in the broader context so i wonder about that you know um of folks going in and especially in times that were so like you shouldn't be here you know what i mean it's got to be difficult you know but closing mike Mm -hmm. before we get in trouble or Mm -hmm. i get in trouble for my communication here um I know you really wanted to talk about Julius W. Becton Jr. Tell us about him. Wow, he's got a career. Holy cow. Yeah, he sure does. So so, wow. so Julius Becton, I mean, I remember even when I was still in the army, he was uh he was very highly regarded. He was uh I mean, he was essentially royalty within the army and uh ranked uh, uh, at least as far as uh soldiers were concerned. I mean, he ranked right up there with Colin Powell. As uh, you know, one of the one of the go-to black figures, um, yeah, in in military leadership, military history, you know, I mean, if you were to uh, ask anyone still serving today, you know, to give the name of you know some some famous black general officers, they would, you know, they, they would definitely say, they would definitely say Colin Powell. They would also say uh, they they would also say Vince Brooks, and uh, you know, I guarantee a few of them would. Uh, be compelled to say Julius Becton. So, you know, he had a, uh, he had a career that actually started, uh, in World War II. Um, you know, at the age of 18, he, uh, joined the, uh, what, what was then the, the Army Air Forces and, uh, you know, was accepted into officer candidate school and, uh, you know, got his career underway right as World War II was ending. Well, after World War II ended, he got out for a little bit, but then when they desegregated the armed forces, he got back in, ended up fighting in, uh, Korea and Vietnam, uh, was a, uh, was very, uh, very highly decorated in both conflicts. Uh, then he ended up, uh, serving as the head of FEMA under Reagan. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and even, uh, many years later, he had a, a brief stint as the superintendent of the DC public school system. Wow. Yeah. So he's, uh, He's he's quite an accomplished uh, man who has done quite a lot in his life. Uh, 
Now, of course, outside of the military, uh, not a lot of people would be able to tell you who Julius Becton is, but and I, I think it's a shame. I mean, I think he really deserves as much uh, as much um, publicity and as much of a legacy as uh, as Colin Powell, but uh, still just a very well accomplished man and a uh, positive role model, I think, for the black community. I'm looking at his awards: Army Distinguished Service Medal, Salvo Star. Legion of Merit, Distinguished Flying Cross, Bronze Star, Air Medal, two with Valor, Army C- Commendation Medal, twice, Purple Heart, two of them. Seriously, Combat Infantry Man Badge, Parachutist Badge. Like, he's got all, I mean, he, he was in World War II, the Cold War. I mean, come on. You know, he did a lot. And yeah. so he's, and, but he did get, Apparently, he was um, honored in Ebony Magazine a few times as one of the most 100 most influ- influential blacks in America. Mm-hmm. You know, but but then, you know, that's great because it goes mostly to the black community. But I want the white community to know about the black people. You know, that's right. me. <laughs> that's me. I'm just going, OK, that's great. But let's put him over here, too. You know, um, so he he really did do a lot, man. And when you look at his face, he's serious. He's like dead at you. Like, yep. boom, I'm not messing around. Like, you look at him, he's not messing around. There's none of that. It's boom. Wow. Cool. Mike, thank you. Always such a good time on the show learning. And you always teach us so much. Um, I got to tell people the latest book is Fire in the Hole, Tales of Combat with the First Engineer Battalion in Vietnam. It's out now. Go to MikeGuardia.com, go Amazon, look at Mike on Amazon. You'll find how many 20 plus books? How many books, Mike? 26. 26. Mike is getting old. (laughs) I'm just teasing you. But uh, Mike, next, what's the next book? Tell everyone. All right. So the next book is going to be Red Bandit. That's a combat history of the MiG-29. Yeah. Everyone stay tuned for that. We'll stay in touch with Mike on that. And next month, we're going to be talking about some interesting women history in the military. We're going to be talking about Hal Moore's wife, right? Mm-hmm. We're going to be, yeah. So stay tuned for that. It's, it's good. It's going to be a good segment. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Big Blend Radio's Military Monday show featuring Mike Guardia, award winning author and historian. Keep up with Mike and his books at MikeGuardia.com. Follow us at BigBlendRadio.com.